It's the Prison News Podcast on Spreaker. Greetings and welcome to Prison News. I'm your host. First up, Barbara Bird Bennett checks into federal prison camp, also known as Camp Cupcake. Disgraced former Chicago Public School CEO Barbara Bird Bennett has a new moniker. Federal inmate number 485-17424. The 68-year-old reported Monday to the Alderson Federal Prison Camp, better known as Camp Cupcake, the former home of domestic goddess Martha Stewart. You folks may remember this is where Martha Stewart went out and created all those yoga shops and things like that. Uh, And life at the remote West Virginia minimum security prison is likely to be a major come down for the one-time $250,000 a year school boss. Uh, and what they call performance pay. Now, she's a disgraced public official, uh, only Chicago, close Chicago public school system. So what was she doing? Yes, taking bribes, taking hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes, what she was ultimately convicted from. And uh, all she can do now, after she's medically screened, she'll either work in the food services or landscaping. Now, when Martha Stewart went down, she told a lie to the FBI in 2005, so she ended up having to go into this place, and she became more successful than ever before, but she described it, the prison diet is absolutely inedible, and she says it has none of the fun of a spiced Moroccan buffet, the the prison food, so I, you know, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, so there we are. Now, there was a yoga class there. Now, when Bird Bennett may not only enjoy the yoga class, but one of the perks is they get to get dogs, and they have a training program when the inmates take a dog out, and they get to keep it for six or eight weeks. Now, the big laughing laughing stock deal, there's an 83-page inmate handbook out there, and uh, it says that inmates are not permitted to give one another a pedicure or a managed cure, except in the cosmetology department. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Well, anyway, speaking of women, Utah woman gets prisoned for starving son, locking him in a feces-covered torture chamber. I'm to picture this woman. She's white, a little overweight, splotchy face, a way turned down mouth, and a kind of a haunting uh, look that uh, just not so very good. Now, this Utah woman was sentenced to prison for locking her then 12-year-old son in a feces-coated bathroom and starving him for more than a year. Brandy K. Jane, spelled J-A-Y-N-E-S, if you choose to go ahead and uh, Google this thing, received three consecutive sentences of 1 to 15 years in prison for child abuse. Now, what she would do, this is Utah. You know what goes on Utah, right? If you've listened to us for any length of time, there's two big, or three places, Texas, Utah, and then uh, sometimes some other places. I don't want to mention right now that things come up a a lot with prison uh, influences. Now, The young boy was found to suffer from a protracted loss of the use of his limbs. And this was because she would have him in that little room. She had a camera. She could watch him suffer. Every other day, he got a couple hot dogs sometimes, and it just messed his limbs up so bad. It almost killed him, really. Uh, The boy only weighed 33 pounds when they found him almost dead, like a skeleton. Uh, Now, the Judge Eric Ludlow, Judge Eric Ludlow, he described the conditions as deplorable. The evidence in the boy's testimony suggests he was kept in isolation for years. Now, it's sickening, uh, they said. The victim, now he's 13 years old, he has bad, his liver has uh, elevated liver enzyme. His skin is peeling, he has low vitamin levels and sores. When he was initially hospitalized, uh, he could barely walk. He's in a lot of pain, they said. His district attorney, Edward Flint, said James did not abuse the victim intentionally. Excuse me defense attorney. God help us for these wonderful defense attorneys. She did not abuse the victim intentionally, but did it as a way to deal with the stress in her life, he said. Well, folks, I've just, for those of you who don't know, women can be just as bad as men, if not worse, when they get somebody, man or woman, down in a box like that, and just watch them suffer and waste away and die right before their very eyes. And, of course, guys have done some nasty stuff, too. Hey, let's go to a little bit better one. This next one's called Prison Inmates Grow Garden, Donate Vegetables to Kokomo Rescue Mission. Boy, this is a much better one. I wish we had more like this to read. This is over in Bunker Hill, Miami Correctional Facility. 
Uh, they donated almost 300 pounds of vegetables and herbs to the Kokomo Rescue Mission. Let me tell you, 300 pounds of herbs is worth some money. Just about five, between five and eighteen dollars a pound in bulk. So that's about three thousand dollars if that's all herbs. The facility has two gardens located on the property, which is beyond uh, the area there. Now, it's in, to get into this program, they have to enroll in a U.S. Department of Labor Apprenticeship Landscape Management Technician Program. <sighs> oh boy, that sounds like a federal government program to me. The inmates, along with now along with correctional staff, that's the key here, have spent hours planting, tilling, and weeding the gardens to ensure their success. Now, all that work has paid off, they say. Now, Kelly uh, Craig, or Craig Kelly, uh, Outreach Ministry Administrator, he says that the Kokomo Rescue Mission really can use this food. It's one of the larger donations he's received, and he never knows from one year to the next what kind of donations coming in. Now, Kaylee said the mission, which offers a men's and a woman's shelter, along with outreach services, will use the vegetables in all the meals they serve. I don't know if they'll be using them in, in uh, breakfast, but what I know, I'm not there. Now, he said every food donation is appreciated, but the fact that some of the vegetables were grown by prison inmates makes the gift even more special because they're learning what he calls life skills. He says if there's anything left over, he'll give it to the community. I want to stop right now. This could be a great program. All right, folks, I apologize. We have a little cord to come loose here. I return, this could be a great program for the inmates to do all this. But when you have paid guards helping or supervising and making sure the inmates do the garden, then let's just say all these this money that they give away some of the vegetables, say only $500 or $1,000 a year get given away in the community. That means a mom and pop that sells vegetables has a diminished income for that day, maybe even that whole week, they take a hit. They don't sell the vegetables, but their taxes continue to go up because prison guards are redirected to start this garden program. What happens if an inmate gets uh, bit by a spider or stung by a bee? Well, they've got to be either hospitalized or medical care. Who pays that? The guy, the mom and pop selling groceries in their store and vegetables, they pay that. Whatever cost is incurred by the inmates, the tax base, the tax revenue goes up. And ultimately, if you were to extrapolate this out and, and make it great, great economies of scale, if you followed it long enough, you could cripple businesses in the community and put people out of business by having inmates do a lot of work and the guards be paid a lot of tax money and then flood this these items into the civilian market. And when a mom and pop or some store is selling the same item, they can't compete. And their tax money's paying for this thing to work against them. That's something that comes up from time to time. In fact, quite often on inmate work programs. Now they don't call them chain gangs anymore. No, no, they're called mobile work crews. Mobile work crew. Now here's one that we want to use a little bit of tact with. It's a kind of a personal deal. The only reason I'm reporting it is because the Federal Bureau of Prisons just went in on this. They now require the prisons themselves to provide all the female inmates with a wide range of feminine hygiene products. And now they have to have two sizes of the tampon, two sizes of the maxi pad. In addition, they have to issue these panty liners. And I mean, I don't know how far you want to go. The bad thing about this is there's a picture with this article of these special pants for women who don't want to wear sanitary protection. It looks like black, big truck driver's underwear with like, let's just say, an inner tube blew up and popped. There was a bunch of, there was like an eight-inch eight, eight strip of inner tube that blew up, was all ugly around the side and stuff, sewn into the front of these things. That's what they look like. And I guess the women use these and they just toss them to be washed and used again. Uh, we don't need that, but, you know, it's, it's part of doing the job, I guess, is reading this information. Next up, a con gets his. Roanoke purse snatching brings man eight years in prison. Now, this is the guy that used to beat women up when he tried to take their... You may recall this guy when he would snatch the purse, he'd hit him in the face. Well, he gets his here. A woman who'd been shopping at a convenience store was putting her bags in her car, and when a man grabbed her purse, she fought back, and in the struggle, she was struck and suffered a swollen lip, McNeil said. On January 20th, the woman headed to her North Jefferson Street apartment and had her purse forcibly taken. 
Now, the bag contained her smartphone, and police were able to track it to a residence in the 1500 block of Gilmer Avenue. The officers were actually able to hear the pinging coming from the phone. Now, this guy's name was Branch. I'm not going to let him get away with this, his last name. Give me just a second here. I want to find out what his real name was. He can't get Oh, Stephen Branch. Stephen Branch. Guy likes to hit women. He may get a little taste of his own medicine when he goes behind bars. Anyway, Branch was found in the apartment with the phone. He was arrested and ultimately gave a statement to police in which he admitted a number of purse snatching, but he denied that he ever used force. Next, human smuggler gets prison for striking a Border Patrol agent with a rock. Now, here's a picture of that guy up in front. He looks almost white. He has a kind of a slanted forehead. He looks right like that uh, wrestler that hung himself here a while back. He looks like that guy, well-muscled. Very prolific human smuggler. This guy's name is Martel Valencia Cortez, 39 years old, convicted of assault on a federal officer and multiple counts of human trafficking for financial gain. He was a bad one. Now, they spotted the Mexican national, they call him now, guiding people across mountains and rocky territory on a chilly night. Now, Valencia Cortez ran from the group when agents intercepted him, and as the agents closed in on him, he took a softball-sized hard rock and... With, I guess with everything he had, threw it, hit one of these federal agents right in the face, and then ran just not very far, which went put him across the way into Mexico, where the federal agents could not follow. He basically, now the agent says that she or he thought they were going to pass out when they got hit by that rock. Now, as a fugitive, Border Patrol officials called Valencia Cortez one of San Diego's most dangerous human smugglers. They said he was known for assaulting agents threatening and intimidating the people he was smuggling and driving the wrong way on streets and freeways to evade arrest. What did he do? He got back there. Some big wigs told him he was probably drawing heat on the wrong people, and he uh, ended up having to turn himself in, and now he's behind bars. Now, you've heard stories about these gangs from South America coming up and that they have to take special tattoos. If they ever try to quit the gang, they're, they're killed right on the spot. Well, you're going to hear about what happens to some couple of guys that try to quit one of the gangs here. So hang on for the ride on this one. A leader of a Detroit gang, nationwide gang, known as Vice Lords, was sentenced to 12 years in prison Tuesday. He admitted to ordering the killing of two brothers who tried to end their affiliation with a gang, referred to them as the traveling Vice Lords in Detroit. Multiple carloads of gang members tracked the brothers who were trying to quit the gang on May 7th, that was back in 2015, and opened fire on the brothers, their mother and a 15-year-old sister, with an AK-47. All four were injured by the gunfire, but they survived. Now bear in mind, this guy takes an AK-47 against an innocent girl who's a, a sister and a mother in an attempt to kill the two sons. Well, let's see what he gets. Want to bet what he's, well, the incident led to the U.S. Attorney Office indicting and successfully convicting a total of nine of the traveling Vice Lords gang members. In addition, a 10th gang member uh, suspected of witness intimidation. Now, these, these sentences range for roughly between three and about 20 years. And then what happens? Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll try to follow this a little bit. This is one that was in the news. Man convicted in Vanderbilt rape case moved to East Tennessee prison. Bledsoe County, Tennessee, a former Vanderbilt football player, was moved to a prison in Bledsoe County after his sentencing last week for aggregated assault and aggravated sexual battery. Brandon Banks was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Now, on Tuesday, the Tennessee Department of Corrections said it moved banks from Nashville to a prison in Bledsoe County, Tennessee, last week. There was no reason really given for it. This is the guy that has some accounts of aggravated rape and aggravated sexual battery. And that in those days, or then, it carried a 15-year um, minimum sentence. Now, Banks testified. Here's how he tried to get out of it. He's a black man, got long black hair, looks like a wide receiver, very athletic. He testifies that he was bullied into participating in this rape. However, prosecutors dismissed the claim as an excuse because they've had video evidence. Well, the victim took the stand during the trial, and guess how many times that victim had to take the stand? Five times they made her testify about the rape over and over 
and over again. Now, the other two players were previously convicted in jury trials. They got 15 to 17 years. And how about 